Good evening, everybody. I'm glad to be um, sharing one more time with you guys. And um, yeah, before starting, I, I want to pray. And then I'll start with the, um, our next, our next um, article from our, our Christian uh, fundamentals. Um, Father God, I just uh, thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Thank you for all what you did for us by sending your son Jesus to the cross um, to die for our sins, to uh, give us um, salvation, to give us forgiveness, to justify us, to sanctify us, and, uh, and to give us an eternal relationship with you, an eternal and unlimited relationship with you. I just pray uh, your Holy Spirit to guide us and to help us to uh, go through the class, Lord, that you will give us uh, the words to use and the understanding we all need, Lord. In Revelation, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right. Um, so, um, the article number 10 um, of what we believe in, in here at church it uh, says, We believe in water baptism by immersion. And all who repent shall be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Water baptism is a spiritual sign author authorized by the Word of God. It manifests by outward act uh, and symbol the inward experience of the believer in his or her repentance and regeneration, which are the works of God's, um, of God's grace. The word baptize principally means to submerge. Um, baptism represents the believer's death, burial, and resurrection with Christ. Immersion, um, I'm sorry, immersion best symbolizes this spiritual experience. Now, um, let me just uh, say, say this. Baptism is intended to represent a spiritual experience that has already occurred. So this rite is administered by the church to those who have uh, repented prior to, to baptism. So, um, yeah, to, to uh, summarize what the baptism is or what it means is uh, the fact that when, when we're immersed in, in water, it symbolizes that we are dying to ourselves. Like the old man uh, died, and once we come uh, out of the waters, it symbolizes a new man. Now I am, I am made new by the blood of Jesus. Um, So, uh, baptism is the practice of scripture, and it protects again two errors. First, uh, it protects against the practice of infant baptism. So, um, we believe, and actually in the Bible, you will never find uh, babies being baptized. Baptize is, uh, to baptize is a decision that as believers we make, and it has to be after uh, we repent, as we will see uh, later on the reason why. It says here, the infant has not become conscious of sin, has not committed sin, and therefore has not repented. Baptism is not to be administered in advance of and in application of repentance. So, yeah, if somebody has never repented and believed in Jesus, um, we cannot baptize him or her in the name of Jesus. First of all, repentance needs uh, to take place. The person has to repent of their sins and confess that they are sinners and confess that they believe in Jesus uh, as their Savior. Number two, it protects against the error of baptismal regeneration. The believer who is baptized has previously previously repented and being and being born again so baptism does not save and does not 
regenerate. So the fact that, um, that you baptize in waters doesn't mean that you're, you're now saved after getting baptized. You, we baptize because we were saved already. And like I said before, um, baptism is just an, an we can say an, a, a public manifest or us just showing the world what already happened. That spiritually I already died to myself and a new man came to life through Jesus or through faith in Jesus. Baptism, baptism is to be administered in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This is so-called Trinitarian formula of water baptism. Baptism is an act of worship, and in that worship, each person, person of the divine trinity is worshipped in the light of his personal work in the salvation of the believer. Um, the Father, is we worship the Father, we worship the Son, and we worship the Holy Spirit when we uh, baptize. So that's why uh, we are baptizing. It's not only that we baptize in the name of Jesus, it's the, the formula to baptize is in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As we'll read it, um, actually we can read it now. It's in Matthew 28, 19. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, when I said... Um, I'll read this again. Um, baptism is intended to represent a spiritual experience that has already occurred. When did that happen? Why, is, why are we saying that when, when you uh, baptize, um, it's just a symbol of something that already happened? And that's in, um, I, I want to open a, a little parenthesis in here. Um, as believers, or we, yeah, as Christians, we have three baptism, three type of baptism. The number one is the one that happens the day that you became a believer, and it's called baptism in Christ. The day that you uh, repent of your sin and believe in Jesus, then you're baptized in Jesus Christ. That's in, in Romans 6, uh, verses, chapter 6, verse 4 and 5, says, Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness, in the likeness of his resurrection. So that's called the baptism in Christ. When, when we repent and believe in Jesus. Then there is the, water, the baptism in water, which is a representation of that first baptism that happened. Um, the day we repent, we repented, and then the third baptism that we believe in is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we already uh, talked about last week, last class. Now, I close that parenthesis and back to the baptism in, in waters. Uh, Colossians, Colossians 2, verse 11 and 12 says, in, in him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Um, now I want to... Uh, Share also, because I, I want to open a little parenthesis in here again, uh, while we talk about um, um, baptism. 
uh, Mark 16, 16 uh, chapter 16, verse 16 to 18, says, He who believes if, and, and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out uh, demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So uh, this is the, the baptism, I'm sorry, the parenthesis I want to talk about because it's in the, the, the Bible relates the signs of the believer to um, uh, the, the baptism in waters. As believers, there are miracles and signs that the word says they will follow us. We don't have to seek uh, these things. We don't have to, there's not like a formula to make the, the sick to be healed or to cast out demons or, or, or to speak in other tongues. The word says that the only thing that we got to do is to believe in Jesus and then all these signs will follow us. But many people also has, they, we have, um, we might have a confusion between what is the signs and what are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So I wanted to, like I said before, open this uh, short parenthesis in here just to uh, explain what's the difference. So the signs, the Bible says it is for all those who believe. But there's, uh, but the uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit that are very similar to the um, signs, but not quite the same. Um, it's the, the, the word says that it is as God um, give to every individual according to his will. And I want to read 1 Corinthians 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 8 to 11. It says, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the, the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each individually as he wills. So in, in this verse, the Bible is talking about um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and it is according to the will of the Lord for everyone to have different kind of, of gifts. I want to just um, mention them, uh, what are they about very quick, because um, in uh, even last week we have a, a, a question that was kind of related to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and uh, but yeah, we couldn't have like uh, enough time to explain all this, so I want to do it now in a, in a very short uh, way. So the first uh, gift of the Holy Spirit is a word of wisdom. The word of wisdom is that um, it's when the, the Lord will constantly use you to, to give an example to resolve problems or to, um, or to have a, the answer for hard questions or to find out what to do in different kind of circumstances, right? And this, is the, this gift of word of wisdom is different than the wisdom that we all receive from God, okay? All of us, we have wisdom. The Lord can give wisdom to every single person, but this special gift will, um, the, the Lord will, to say it in a way, activate it in your life or will give it to you. And it's something that, hey, is, is out of your control. It's just like a word that comes to your, to your mind or through a vision or in a dream. 
where the Lord can give you, hey, the interpretation of a dream, the interpretation of a, of a vision or, or whatever um, solution for, a, let's say, a, an enigma or a, something that nobody could resolve. The Lord gave you the correct words to do or, or, or the Lord told you what to do. Then, um, work of knowledge, wisdom, no, the word uh, of knowledge, is when the Lord shows you something that you couldn't know by your own, okay? Let's say if, if I, to give an example, I come to a person and I start praying to that person, Uh, for that person and the Holy Spirit starts to show me things about this person that she never told me or he never told me but the Lord is revealing this to me for example hey the, the Lord is showing me that you're going through a hard circumstances you're you're you I don't know you you suffer a lot because this or that whatever just something that the person will be like hey how did he know Well, only the Lord could, could reveal that to, to me in this case or whoever is praying. And then um, this, the next one, gift of healings. Now, as believers, there is the sign of healing and there is the gift of healing. This is different, okay? What's the main difference in here? All believers have the authority to go and pray for the sick, and the, and the word says that the sick will be healed. So, hey, if one, if you have been a Christian for, I don't know, for 30 years, to give an example, and you have prayed for, for people uh, to, 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 to heal, and they heal, but it, it has been only, just to give an example, five or six or seven or, or ten Um, that have been healed after you prayed, that is a sign. But the gift of healing is when it happens way more often. Like you can know, okay, it's not only a sign, this is real, the, really the gift of healing. The word says that even the, the shade of the apostles, by going over the, the sick people, even with them, uh, without them praying, they will be healed. Right? So, um, if, if you're a person, uh, and, and we can see this gift uh, a lot in, in evangelists, when they stand in, in a stage and they start to pray, and multitudes start to receive uh, healing, then you can say, okay, now it's not only the sign, uh, the Lord has given to me the gift of healing. Um, let me go back here. Then to another, the work, working of miracles, and this is when uh, the Lord uses you constantly and often in different kind of miracles, whatever you, you want to you wanna call it, when you pray for a financial miracle and it happens when, um, I don't know, whatever things that are impossible for men to do, but after you pray, like the Lord work huge miracles, then you can say, okay, I know that the Lord has given to me the, the, um, the gift, not only the sign, but the, but the gift. To another, prophecy. Prophecy um, normally is related to two things. When the Lord gives you a, a word of encouragement or even a word of correction for somebody, that's prophecy, but also When the Lord speaks to your life of the future, somebody, and the Lord gives you a prophecy, and you are praying for somebody, and then the Lord shows you, hey, tell this person I'm going to use him, or I'm going to use her to go, I don't know, to Africa, or tell her that um, next year by this time she will have a new job, or he will um, move to another city, whatever, whatever is related to the to something that is going to happen in, in the future. That's uh, the gift of, of prophecy. 
the Lord can use you in prophecy as a, as a sign, but if it's something like it's constantly happening in your life, that every time you pray, the Lord shows you something, a vision, a dream, whatever, then you can identify, hey, I have the, this is not the sign, this is the gift that the Lord has given to me. Um, a discerning of spirits, it's very important. It's the discernment or the, or the, the wisdom that the Lord gives us to know when something is coming from God or when it is coming from the world or from Satan, okay? Uh, I think I shared this two weeks ago. Um, the uh, Satan can, or he has, let's say in this way, he has the power to make miracles just to deceive people, okay? So yeah, even when, when you read the Bible, you, you can see how Satan has limited power, but his power is more than human being. Like, it's more than us. Only with God's power, with God's power, we can defeat the enemy. We will never do it with our, with our own power because even though he's not as powerful as God, he's way more powerful than us. So he can do any kind of manifestations to deceive the world, to deceive even the believers. The Bible says that even he will try to deceive the, the believers by, by doing great signs. And even the Bible says that when the uh, Antichrist come, he will, uh, a, a, a false prophet will be with him. And this false prophet will be able even to work huge miracles to deceive the people. But with the uh, gift of um, discernment of spirits, you will be able, or we will be able to know, hey, this is not of God. It looks like it is God, but I know it is not God. Then we have um, different kind of, of tongues. And this is a question that uh, our brother uh, Peter asked last week. If every time we speak in tongues... Um, if we need the uh, interpretation, because it's like two gifts that go together. They, they go together. Uh, speaking uh, different kinds of tongues and the interpretation of these different kind of, of tongues. When it is the gift, not the sign, when it is the gift of speaking in tongues, yeah, interpretation will always come with it. When it is the sign of the Holy Spirit, uh, not always we'll have interpretation. But when it is the gift of the Holy Spirit, and this is when the Lord constantly is using you in new tongues, in new tongues, like very often, like all the time. And then the Lord will give you the interpretation or the Lord will give somebody else around uh, the interpretation. Then that's the gift. And The, the gift of, of interpretation of tongues, it's not like you go and, and study the, um, the language that your brother is speaking and then you translate it. No. By, by the work of the Holy Spirit, you will be able to understand a tongue that you, in your own mind or in your own strength, will never understand it. There is no way you will understand it. But the Lord will give you the interpretation. So, um, and the last verse says, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he will. So, the science is for every believer. The um, gift of the Holy Spirit are according to the will of the, of the Lord. He will say, I will give this person this gift and this other person this other gift he can say I will give all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit to this person and to other one just one or two or whatever is according to his will was that clear amen okay so um, back to the um, um, baptism waters just to I close that uh, parenthesis 
Um, when we read the book of Acts, we will find that every time a believer or a person, an unbeliever, will start to believe in Jesus, the first thing that they will do was, or, or, yeah, was to find a place and get him baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But if by any chance we, somebody doesn't have the possibility to get baptized in, in water, that doesn't mean this person is not going to be saved. Because in, in um, Mark 16, 16, the emphasis is not the fact that they are getting baptized. It's the fact that they are believing in, in Jesus. The best example that we can give is the, is the criminal that died on the cross uh, with Jesus. He, there were two criminals with Jesus, but the one did believe. But this guy did not have time to get off the cross, go and baptize and come back to the cross and die and then go to heaven. No, Jesus said to him, I will see you today in paradise or you will be with me today in paradise. So it's even though God wants us to get baptized, if we don't, if we don't have the possibility of getting baptized, that doesn't mean that we will not go to heaven. But if we do have the possibility to get baptized and we are rejecting baptism, okay, that is a problem. The Bible says that every believer should be baptized. Now, the word, doesn't, the word doesn't say as soon as possible, but if you ask me, yeah, as soon as possible. As soon as you can make it, go and do it and, and participate of this um, beautiful um, ritual that the, that the Lord has uh, given us to uh, or has commanded us to participate in. Wow, time flies in here. Okay, article uh, number 12, let's move over. There's so, I'm sorry, 11, so many things to say. So uh, article 11 says, we believe in divine, heal uh, divine healing is provided for all in the atonement or in Jesus' sacrifice. Um, the term divine healing refers to the restoring of health by direct divine intervention. The healing may be physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, whatever it is, but the Lord will heal you. Even if, you are, if your finances are not good for whatever reason, the Lord can heal your finances. The Lord can heal anything that is wrong in your life because Jesus paid for our healing in every single aspect on the cross. Now, refer uh, it says reference is made here to the provision of healing by the redemptive work of Christ. It is recognized that all healing is provided by the goodness of God, whether the healing is administered by counsel, medical skills, or the application of medicine itself. The utilization of such skills does not require a covenant relationship of faith on the part of either the minister or, or the recipient. And the word atonement is the redemptive work of Christ. In this particular case, reference is made to the sacrificial and substitutionary death of Christ. In this work, Christ not only satisfied the judgment of sin against us, but also he broke the power of sin and thus provided deliverance from the consequences of sin. Physical infirmity is the result of the fall of man into sin. Although illness cannot be directly attributed to personal act of sins, it is at attributable to Adamic sin. God did not create us to, um, to, to be sick. 
God did not create us, created us, did not create us, not even to die. When he created Adam and uh, Eve, they were perfect. They had no needs. They didn't have any health problems at all. But it was when they decided to disobey the Lord, when they decided to go against the commandments of God, that then all these things of death and infirmities and, and sickness, etc., started to take place. So because of Adam's sin, then um, death took place into the world. Christ's redemptive work, his death and resurrection, conquers sins. In spiritual experience, Christ provides for forgiveness of, I'm sorry, let me read that again. In spiritual experience, Christ provides for forgiveness of and cleansing from sin. In physical experience, Christ provides for healing and resurrection. Now, in the Bible, we find many, many examples of Jesus healing people, of Jesus praying for the sick, and, and they were being healed. And the apostles um, in the book of Acts, like I, like I said before, even with their uh, uh, shadow, people was being healed. So um, the, the, the power of the Lord is unbelievable. There is no sickness that the Lord cannot take care of. However, um, more than... Uh, Watching these examples, we get to read the promises that God made to us in, in his word. The, God, uh, the Lord promised, even in the Old Testament, that he will heal anything. Like I said before, our body, our soul, our spirit, anything that needs healing, the Lord will do it. Psalm uh, 1 103, verse 2 and 3 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your disease. This is important. I love the fact that it says, and forget not all his benefits. Forget not all his benefits. If we don't read the word of God, if we don't know what are the benefits that we receive uh, for being children of God, then how will we will ask the Lord to make it, to do it in our lives, right? So it is important that we are aware of the promises of God for us. Matthew 8, verse 16, 17. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the, spirit, the spirits with a word, and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. So in this case, they were bringing uh, to Jesus' people that needed uh, spiritual healing because they were demon-possessed. So their, all of uh, the, the cause of their sickness and sufferings was basically demonic attacks. But, there, but also there was people that needed, uh, that their sickness was not caused uh, by a spiritual thing, but it was just something physical even if it's physical or spiritual the lord will provide healing to your life but we need to believe in him we need to believe that he um that um as he's as isaiah says that he took my infirmities and bore my sickness we always have to remember that jesus you took away my infirmities 
and you bore uh, my sickness on you. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was uh, wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Uh, the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. First uh, Peter 2.24 um, says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the, on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. James um, chapter 5, verse 14 to 16. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will rise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous, of a righteous man avails much. So, hey, am I feeling sick? And I'm not saying don't, don't call the doctor, don't go to the doctor. For sure, if you're feeling sick, hey, feel free to call the doctor. But also, call your pastor, call one of the elders, text message him and ask for prayer for healing. It's not only that we will um, take care of the physical aspect. In the spirit, there is something else that we cannot just uh, forget about it. Let us know when you need prayer for, for um, healing. It's going to be too hard as pastors. Can you imagine that? Me all the time calling people. Hey, are you feeling sick today or no? Hey, are you feeling sick today or no? Hey, are you feeling sick today or no? That's impossible, right? So, Bible says, call the elders, call the pastor, and let them know so they can, they can pray. And, uh, and, the, uh, and by the prayer, in faith, you will be healed. Now, I want to go uh, to article number 12. Um, before we uh, continue, yeah, this is going to be the last one for today before we um, go on, on prayer. Article number 12 says, we believe in the Lord's Supper and the washing of the saints' feet. I'll read it again. We believe in the Lord's Supper and the washing of the saints' feet. Wow. The Lord's Supper is a symbolic act in which believers partake of the broken bread, representing Christ's broken body, and the fruit of the vine, representing uh, Christ's shed blood. As believers uh, receive this meal in faith, the Holy Spirit gives them spiritual strength and renewal. They are nourished by eating Christ's body and by drinking his blood in the spirit. The, uh, this ordinance is celebrated as a meal, as a memorial of Christ's death and as a prediction of his return in glory. So when we uh, eat the bread, we're not literally eating Jesus' body. And, and I know there are some other Christians that believe that a, a, a miracle happens and really that bread becomes the, the real body of Christ, like, like the flesh. And no, this is not what we find in the Bible. It's just a, sim, a symbol of Jesus dying on the cross for us. His uh, body that, that was broken for us and his 
blood that was shed for us. So um, every time we are going to participate in the uh, Lord's Supper, well, first of all, the only ones that can participate or that should par participate in, in the Lord's Supper are believers. Again, this is not for unbelievers. Uh, the same, it's, it's the same with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's the same uh, with uh, baptism in waters, uh, with baptism in Christ. It's only for believers. If an unbeliever participates of this, there is going to have, this person is going to have spiritual problems that, uh, yeah, it will be too long to talk about it. But as believers, we really should participate in this. Many believers uh, will choose to not participate in the, in the uh, Lord's Supper. But uh, really, what Jesus is saying, hey, is do it. Participate on, on it. You feel like, hey, maybe once, yeah, for sure, I can understand. Some people feel like, hey, maybe... Um, for whatever reason that happened in my life, I won't have it today, okay, that I can understand. And you'll say, hey, before I want to, I've, I've not been coming to church, I don't know, in 10 years. I've been living away from the Lord for, I don't know, whatever number of years. And I want to first, um, like, uh, um, make my life or, or make things clear in my life before I participate. Yeah, that, that I understand. But if a person that claims to be a believer and never participates in the Lord's Supper, that is not biblical. The word says that if we believe in Jesus, we should participate in this ritual of, uh, that is just uh, a remembrance of what he did on the, on the cross f for us. The meal which Jesus instituted as a ceremony of worship is, this, is designated as supper because it is received as a meal and because it represents spiritual nourishment. It is designated Lord's Supper because he was the host at its historical inauguration and he remains the host in all instance, instances of its subsequent celebration. So every time we participate of the Lord's Supper, we're basically receiving spiritual food, spiritual strength, uh, and in the spiritual aspect, even though we don't see it, we are participating with Christ of this Lord's Supper. So it has a powerful and a significant, a very significant um, meaning when it comes to the spiritual aspect in our lives. Now, about the washing of the feet. The washing of feet is a symbolic act in which believers serve each other physically and spiritually by washing one another's feet. By exercising this ceremony by faith, believers receive and renew their spiritual cleansing minister to them and in them by the Holy Spirit. The ordinance is also a ceremony of believers' mutual uh, service to one another. In the name of Christ, they become servants to one another. Now I want to read a few verses. I have, uh, well, this one is actually for the Lord's Supper. Uh, Matthew 26, uh, chapter 26, verse 26 to 29 says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood, of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the, of the vine from now on 
until that day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So it is a commandment that Jesus gave um, all of you guys. He's saying all of you should drink it. All of you should participate of it. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26. For I receive from the Lord, and this is Paul speaking in here. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it this, t take it, take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So that's why it's so important. When, when we participate of, of the Lord's Supper, we're saying, hey, Lord, you died for me and you will come, you will return, you will come back. This is, that's something that we will talk ne next class if, if, God, um, uh, if God wills. So it is a symbolic, it is something we do in remembrance of him. Now, about um, the washing of the feet, uh, John chapter 13, verse 5 to 15. It's going to be a little bit uh, long to read. So please be uh, patient with me. Uh, verse 5 says, After that, he poured water into a, a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to, the, to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bath needs only to wash his feet. But is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would uh, betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, uh, taken his garment, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. And you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So the washing of the feet means, well, a lot of things. But I want to say just two aspects of this. Number one is the... Uh, Humbling ourselves. Hey, it is kind of humbling experience when you when you have to uh, wash somebody else's uh, feet. And I, I guess like yeah, in these times, yeah, you can have your you can keep your feet uh, kind of decent, right? But in that time. In the time of the apostles, where they were all all the time wearing sandals, and uh, the 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 roads were dusty, I don't know how clean those feet were. I don't think very clean. Probably they were disgusting. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
I have to say this. If there is something that I always do and my wife knows is I always have my feet clean. <laughs> I cannot, for whatever reason, I cannot have my hands and my, and my feet uh, dirty. Like, I don't have a problem getting, getting dirty, but as soon as possible, I like to, um, to wash my hand and, and my feet. So, yeah, I normally uh, try to, uh, even at home, to use my sandals so, I, so, so my, feet, my feet won't get too dirty. So, that time, hey, this is God. This is the Lord Jesus Christ humbling himself, touching those horrible, dirty feet. I don't know how often the apostles used to cut their nails. Um, who knows? <laughs> who knows for how long Peter did not cut his nails that he said, are you washing my feet? Are you crazy? But Jesus is saying, hey, you know what? I need to give example on how if I am the Savior and I am doing this, hey, you guys have to be humble and, and remember that you're not more than anyone else, right? We all have to serve to one another. And number two, uh, the, 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 um, the other symbol in the washing of feet is sanctification. Jesus said, hey, if you have been already washed, you don't need to be washed again. Only your feet. Why? Because that's our life here in, in this, in, in this um, earth. We have already been sanctified by the Lord. The Lord will call you holy. The Lord will call you perfect. The, the Lord will call you just if you have believed in Jesus because now he sees Jesus in you. But also, there is an aspect of sin in this world. We're walking in, in this world that is basically everything in this world is sin. When you look at the world, oh my goodness, they don't care about God at all. So it is impossible it is impossible that a Christian will never sin again. It is impossible. We will always commit sin. Sometimes we will. Sometimes we don't. But that sin means that our, our feet get dirty. And we need the Lord to, with his blood in that spiritual aspect, we need the Lord to clean our feet. The Lord has said, hey, you know what? You're just and, and, and you're clean. You have been uh, bathed by my blood. But in spiritually, because of you guys are in this world, you still need my blood for me to wash your, your, your feet. So basically, that it's a symbol of us understanding that, hey, even the Lord have, has already saved us. Um, repentance is something that is continual, continual. We always have to have an attitude of, Lord, wash away my sins one more time. Uh, um, just continue sanctifying me, continue cleaning me, continue making my life more according to you. As I am in this earth, my feet get dirty, but by your blood, they uh, will be washed. So, uh, yeah, those are the... Uh, the three um, aspects that I wanna I wanted to share today. I wanna know if anybody has any question, or if um, there is somebody that would like to um, share something about this. Do you have any question today? Any testimony? Anything you guys want to share? All right. Okay. Let's uh, start with our, our prayer time. So. Um, just feel free. You can stay on, 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 your, on your seat or you can uh, get on your knees. You can get on your feet. Whatever you, you do, uh, uh, just um, have an attitude or, and have um, yeah, a, a disposition to humble yourself before the Lord as we 
uh, start our, our prayer time. Father, hey Lighthouse family, thank you so much for tuning in to another one of our services. We have a couple more sermons highlighted for you on the annotations here and here, so click if you're interested, or tune into one of our live streams at lighthouseniagara.com at 10 o'clock every single week. Have a great day. God bless.